Guys, welcome back to the Hawksville Rundown. Today on the show, we have draft expert Emery Hunt, uh, creator of Football Game Plan Draft Guide and also a draft expert for CBS. Really excited for today's show, man. Emery's going to come on. We are two weeks out from the draft here. So, you know, he is he is a draft specialist and doesn't just follow the norm. This guy comes on and he's a guy that does has does his research extensively and he's going to give you guys where you like, mm, really? And then you, you sort of realize where he's coming from and it, and it all starts making some sense. So Emery's coming on. We're going to really dive into, you know, what the Hawks are going to do possibly at the first round at number 16. Do they hold, do they stick and pick or do the, do they uh, do the traditional John Schneider thing and trade back for some picks? Obviously we're going to get into the QB situation, QB talk. Uh, Emery always has a, a good top 10 list and he, he kind of goes further than that, but we'll, we'll look at his 10 and there's a couple of names in there that might surprise you guys and, and really intrigue you. And we're going to, we're going to dial that in with him. Uh, but uh, yeah, Bryce. So I'm excited, man. What's uh, what's happening, man. Two weeks out here. Yeah, man. I'm getting excited, man. Where it's like Christmas. We're getting that close countdown here right into the, you know, when we get to start opening our draft day presents in the draft and um, yeah, man, I'm super excited to have Emery on. Like I've, listen to him on Dan's show um, and also his stuff that he does on CBS. He's, he goes on his own path with the draft. He doesn't just follow what every analyst says and goes with, he, like you said, he does his own research. And I think our listeners are going to be surprised. Some of the, some of the guys he's excited about that you may never heard of. And especially I'll tell our listeners, his QB list is definitely one that's going to be a lot different than the Daniel Jeremiah's and, and the guys like that and the Mel Kuyper's of the world. Yeah, absolutely. So, and then really quickly, really quickly, there was some breaking news there. Lakin Tomlinson, right? Yeah. Uh, old lineman, uh, just signed. So, why Correct. don't we touch on that really, really quickly? Yeah. So, uh, obviously, we just started the show and he uh, just signed with Seattle. So, Lakin Tomlinson drafted in the uh, 2015. He was a first round pick by the Detroit Lions. He's a bigger guard now. So he's 6'3", 323. Um, He's played for the Jets last year, San Francisco before that. Um, Kind of for me, it's an interesting, like they got a veteran guard now. So you kind of can project their top five a little bit. Bradford on one side, Tomlinson on the other. Um, But it'll be very interesting to see what Seattle now does and if this impacts what they do with that first pick. Um, That'll be something we ask Emery coming up now, now that they've got a veteran guard that they've signed before the draft. We're definitely going to ask Emery that and Emery Hunt coming on the other side. Well, I'm the best corner to get. What a run. Marshawn Lynch. Get off me. DK. What's up? Hey, it's Josh Curry with the Seattle Seahawks. This offense, just in general. I mean, you add to a guy just like watching that. His front, he seems more of a back. Just the then. presence he's got in that pocket, the way he throws the football. Rust days, man. All the scrutiny that line was under. This Monday night's big. All right, guys, welcome back to the show. Today on the show, we have Emery Hunt, uh, creator of the Football Game Plan Draft Guide, and also draft expert for CBS. Emery, man, we really appreciate you uh, joining us. A couple weeks out from the draft here, and uh, just get your expertise. No, I appreciate you guys bringing me on the show, man. Glad to be here. Awesome, man. Yeah, we appreciate you coming on. So well, let's uh, let's dive into it, man. Obviously, the Seahawks got a couple of glaring needs. You know, they've, they've done some stuff in free agency, plugged some holes, all this kind of stuff. There's still, you know, that that glaring hole at the offensive line. They, they've just signed a guy actually just now. But uh, we're sitting at 16, sort of middle of the pack. Uh, John traditionally obviously likes to trade down. Accumulate some picks. We're not sitting with a lot this year. We're sitting running around seven picks. What do you What do you think the, they want to do there at sixteen? Do you think they do you see them trading back, or do you kind of see because it's a pretty quarterback top heavy draft that you know this this sixteen could be more like maybe a top ten pick with with some of the players that are out there that they might look at. So what what do you think they do there at sixteen? You know, it's it's unique because I feel like they can just sit pat and and get a really good player. Um, at the end of the day, when you're looking at the roster, you got to fi- figure out, okay, where are the depth holes? Can we fill that with uh, in a, an elite player or a top-tier player that can help us in year one? 
or do we even have enough spots on the roster to, uh, you know, have a lot of draft picks? You know, you may see this situation with a team like the Cleveland Browns, where their depth chart is, is stacked. They may not have enough, you know, room for for rookies. So you may see them package up and move up to get a specific guy. They may be a little bit more aggressive in the draft. Seattle, I feel like they've done a, a lot of good work in all season. Um, and so there's only a few spots depth wise and guys that you drafted last year or the year before that you want to see develop and play a significant role. All of that factors in. So I feel like they'll sit right there where they are and take a good player. So with that being said, Emery, do you see them going more on the offensive side of that or the defensive side? Or is it really just kind of who falls to them and they just decide there? I think it's a little bit of who falls because uh, you, you guys kind of touched on it earlier where, you know, you're, you're expecting quarterback to go one, two, and three. And then, you know, four could be a situation where we could see a run on receivers because you assume, barring no trades, you assume the Cardinals will take a, a receiver. The Chargers potentially could be there at re taking a receiver as well as the Giants. So that also pushes a position down. You may also see someone, uh, maybe the Titans, start the run on tackles, which can then push more positions down. So it's a unique spot in a draft where you have elite level talent at receiver. Uh, you have three quarterback needy teams right at the top and you have an elite tackle class. So that's why I said kind of sitting where you are could give you a little bit of the best of both worlds. You can, Hey, we could take a, a really good player regardless of the offensive line or defensive line. Or if we feel like we can accumulate maybe an additional early day two pick we could move down a spot uh with someone that wants to get up and maybe get you know a receiver or someone like that uh but if you're sitting there where the seahawks are you probably can get someone that's that's really good on a defensive line that can help you out year one that's my opinion i feel like there's guys that they can help seattle out right now uh up front yeah no absolutely I, yeah i agree with that so if if you look at like you said um kind of looking at your list of QBs that you got out there. You got a couple of guys out there. One Spencer Rattler uh, that we've talked a lot about on this podcast. Like, you know, we look at him, obviously a lot of guys look at him as a day two guy. You, you have him ranked in your top five. Um, and, and like, I, I love the guy. I just love his mentality. You know, obviously he's went through a lot of adversity. Um, obviously he's got a lot of skill sets too. Uh, and then, you know, the maturity is kind of showing up. Obviously you got to go through the interviews and kind of really see, Okay, is this the guy that can be a leader in our team? Um, but when you look when you look at a guy like that, um, you have him high. A lot of people have him like you know way back. So you know, you obviously you're not going to pick that guy in the first. But you know, is that a guy do you, that you see maybe could fit this team? Because obviously, right now you have Sam Howell and you have Geno, both contracts ended 2025. So we we look at it like we were convinced they're going to take a QB in this draft before the Sam Howell trade. Then when that trade happened, we were sort of like, well, I'm not sure now maybe they're a little content and they're going to kick the can again. Like that's sort of, we sort of want to be like, we need some guy that we could see being the guy for the next seven, eight, nine years. Do you see a, a guy like that? They brought him in. They obviously talked to, to Rattler. Do you, do you see a fit there? And, and then where do you realistically see that you could maybe grab him in the draft? I mean, it's a unique fit, uh, honestly, but you know, I feel like we got to get out of the mindset of thinking a player can be with your franchise for seven, eight years. So yeah. those those days are gone. Um, right. We're seeing teams move off guys after their first year. Some guys they even get in the fifth year. So, you know, I'm saying that to say we may see them kick the can down the road again because you got two capable starters. You got Geno Smith, um, who's maybe old in age, but not in game. You know, he's still able to play because he hadn't played a lot. You know, if you think about the inactive part of his career, kind of like Kurt Warner had them six years of just kind of nothing, right? Before he had a, a second chapter in Arizona. So I feel like Geno Smith will still be in their plans. Uh, you bring in Sam Howell, who started a lot of games last year, started the full season last year. Um, and they feel like, okay, we can, we got a cheap contract with that. Yes, you want to play in the future, but when you're talking about somewhere, uh, Spencer Rattler. I feel like Spencer Rattler could also go high second, and it wouldn't surprise me to see some team value him enough to where, hey, we'll get back in the first and get him to get that fifth-year option. So if they're going to go quarterback, it probably won't be someone of the caliber of Spencer Rattler, 
you're thinking of maybe someone down the line, maybe on you know day three, maybe someone like a uh, a Jordan Travis who you won't be pressed to put in right now uh, because of the injury. You could let him nurse himself back, groom, develop, and then you get some answers going into next offseason. Maybe you say, okay, well, we're going to roll with this guy. Uh, at least he's been in our program learning for a full year with no expectation of playing. Uh, and then that could be a, a next progression because if you're thinking Spencer Rattler and if you like him like I like him, then I feel like that he's going to be gone um, to a team that's going to probably use his services this year. Right. So with your list, Emery, because I've just got it kind of pulled up here, and you got Spencer at three, Jordan Travis at four, Drake May, Michael Penix, and J.J. McCarthy. Now, most of the analysts out there have those guys up with Caleb Williams. I'm high. I've been high on Rattler. I've been high on Jordan Travis. What about Jordan Travis? You know, obviously he's coming off the devastating leg injury he got last year. What makes you push him above Penix, May, and McCarthy compared to everybody else? You've seen him get better over time, and in the last two seasons, we saw him get significantly better to where they're flirting with playoff appearances. Had he not gotten injured this year, they'd been they would have been in the playoffs. They probably would have won the national championship. They were really good with him under center. Um, different team with, with with Travis there, and I feel like when you look at him, he has a perfect blend of uh, athleticism and the ability to play great situational football. That's important. Um, and there's less questions about him. Yeah, his he may be a little bit of a flat line thrower. You know, he may be a little bit of a, uh, you know, his deep ball accuracy has has a lot to be desired. But in the short to intermediate passing game, he's excellent. When the game is on the line, he seems to lock in rather well and play efficient football and protects the football. And we've seen him play in big time games and be the reason why their team has come out on top. And so when you've seen that over time, you're like, this dude has the goods. And that's why I feel like had he not gotten injured, he would have been able to go through the playoffs. We know how that did for C.J. Stroud. And we would have seen him go through the postseason all-star game circuit. Probably would have been in the senior bowl as opposed to the Shrine game. Either way, he would have played in that in the all-star game, had, to, had been, been able to participate the entire week. And we know he would have gone to the combine and probably would have thrown, jumped, shown the athleticism. And we'll be talking about him how people are talking about J.J. McCarthy in terms of being a first-round quarterback. So I just think it's an unfortunate injury, but good thing for him, he just broke his leg. It didn't get amputated, you know what I'm saying? So he should be back ready to go, you know, uh, come this season. Yeah, you so, know what? Oh, go, go ahead. ahead. No, sorry, Bryce. Go ahead, man. So with J.J., why do you think he's now skyrocketed up to the boards? Like, I've seen different guys say that he's, you know, potentially going to be a trade option up for – the Vikings or somewhere in there. And I'm just personally for me, like I, I watched some of JJ stuff and yeah, I can see some intangibles that are there, but there's moments where I, I just don't see enough throws from his years in college to really go and say, Hey, like how does this translate to an NFL team and stuff like that? Because he was carried so much by the run game and that structure of that offense. Well, it's, it's fascinating. I feel like a lot of, um, and I don't want to speak for anyone, but it just seems to me, outside looking in on uh, other people's process is that they are trying to, they're more mock drafters and trying to guess where a guy is going to go as opposed to getting the evaluation right. So if you have your top four quarterbacks as, you know, one of the four guys of Jaden Daniels, Caleb Williams, Drake May, J.J. McCarthy, you're never not going to be uh, wrong. Oh, well, you know, he was my number four QB. Uh, do you really think he's the fourth best quarterback in this class, or are you are you saying he is going to go within the first one of the first four quarterbacks being selected? Two different things. So, so like when you look at my list, I'm basing it off how I think the guy is going to play, um, no matter where he goes. And I feel like some people just try to win the draft and win the mock draft and say, "Yeah, I told you he was going to go to to you know to the Patriots and look at him. He went to the Patriots, so I know what I'm talking about, right?" And I, I feel like that's the difference where. You know, are you an evaluator or are you a, a mock drafter or are you a draft reporter or a draft analyst? Because if you are a draft analyst and an evaluator, there's nothing you've seen on tape that will tell you that McCarthy should be in that same conversation with those with Caleb Williams and Jaden Daniels. And if you are evaluating the talent, like, for instance, even with all we've seen from uh, Brock Purdy, and what we know of Brock Purdy, 
you're still not taking Brock Purdy in the top five of an NFL draft, you know, because right. you've seen what has to be around him for him to, right. to do to do his part, his 111, right? And that's what J.J. McCarthy was doing was his 111. Now, to his credit, you know, if you don't throw the ball a lot, I don't consider that necessarily a knock. I look at it like, okay, we may ask him to throw 17 times a game. He better hit 13 to 14 of them. So there's more pressure on you hitting the throws that you do have to make as opposed to a guy that's out there throwing the ball 40 times. And he could miss 13 and still have a good game. So there's some skill in the sense of, hey, I'm protecting the football. I'm keeping you know my offense on the field. I'm able to move the sticks. And when my number is called, whether it, we're on a nine-play drive and I haven't thrown the ball at all, but it's play 10 and you need me to convert a third and five, I'm able to co convert that third and five. So there's some value in that. But that shows you that he could be a piece of the puzzle, not the entire puzzle. Right. Right. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, I just want to turn it back to, to Jordan Travis, because obviously we, we were high on him. And, you know, and, and to, for us, it's it's a perfect situation, because like you said, you still have Geno Smith and Sam Howell on the roster. He obviously, broken leg, he's not going to play. So here's a guy that, yeah, you can well, if you can get him late, he can kind of sit in the back burner. Fans don't have to be like screaming like hey you drafted a guy why aren't you playing him like you know i look at and i look at a situation you know like yeah you, you would say green bay when they drafted jordan love early and you know people were like what was that move and you know where's aaron's weapons and you know and so you don't have to have to deal with that but then obviously you see the value in a guy that can sit in a system and, and learn the system you know obviously has a good skill set like love and then and then have a great season when he when he gets his first starting season um, so, you know, you kind of say, Hey, why, why not? If you can sort of, like you said, maybe you kick the can of the next year, but if you can get a guy late, like a guy like that, if people are just passing up on him, then, then maybe that would be a, a good spot. Like we even looked at last year when, uh, you, we, we were, we thought for sure, like Anthony Richardson was going to Seattle if, if he was there at five, just because that would have been a, another really good situation for everybody where he could sit, learn the system. He, he had limited games in, in college ball. So it was like, you know, that to, to us, that looked good. Another name I want to get your thought on as far as a fit, maybe, you know, project type is Milton. Do you think they're even, could you see them being like, hey, this could be a guy that we get if we get him really late and say, you know, maybe he's just a project type kind of guy and and maybe, you know, in a year or two, maybe something develops there. Do, do you even see anything at all or do you, do you not even see them looking at at a guy like that? I mean, it's always possible. It's just that you got to ask yourself, what can we do differently than what happened at Michigan with Harbaugh, than what happened with Josh Hypo at Tennessee? It's two major programs where he's had the starting job and lost it um, and, and has played some great games, has played some bad games. So you kind of you, you got two separate looks at him for, from two different programs and you still had similar results. So it's kind of like, OK, well, what? What is there to, let's say, develop? Is it, yeah. can we get him out this offense? Because it was two separate offenses he played in. Maybe, you know, you, you run the ball heavily and then play action pass, and that's where he can have some value. Um, but even on his deep balls, he didn't connect at a high rate, as you would expect a guy with that level of arm talent to really connect deep down the field. You know, so it, he's a unique player. Um, I do feel like, you know, if he was in a certain situation, old school type of way where, again, you're heavy run run game, take your time to shots deep down the field. If he can consistently connect on a deep ball, if he can improve uh, the timing and accuracy there, uh, maybe you have something. But he's going to be interesting to watch uh, yeah. progress uh, and where he ends up and how he plays in the preseason because he still has to get better in his, his lower body. I feel like his lower body tends to be a little bit too heavy in terms of just standing flat foot in the pocket, not really bouncing around. Um, and he is an athlete. You want to see him utilize that a little bit more. Mm. And once his lower body gets gets to, together and becomes a little bit more consistent, then you'll see him start to connect deeper down the field on, on a more frequent basis. So my last question about your list here, Emery, which is the one that I find the most interesting, is you have Bo Nix at the bottom of your list. And – this is the first list I've seen where Bo Nix is this far down below a Joe Milton and a, and a Michael Pratt and stuff. And like you said earlier, sometimes it's about people mocking, oh, I nailed where he's going to go. What is it that makes 
Bo Nix not an appealing maybe choice for you at a quarterback level, considering I know last year and the year before he had some pretty good success at Oregon. He had his stint in Auburn. What, what is it about Bo Nix that you're just not very high on? It's the streakiness of his game, you know, and you saw some of the Auburn Bo Nix creep up in the Oregon Bo Nix, you know, and I know people will point to the uh, completion percentage, but then you got to look at the yards per attempt and look at how they played that offense. And his deep ball wasn't really consistent, you know, where people question whether or not he had the arm strength. I still think it's a little bit okay. And so for for me, it's just like, you know, he's kind of he's kind of on that Sam Howell type plane. Um, you know, they both built about the same way. They both really good athletes. They both can run. Um, Sam Howell is a little bit more uh, apt to connect on that deep ball a little bit more frequently, and I feel like he has a stronger arm. Than Bo Nix, um, but I feel like Bo Nix just a, a little bit too streaky for my life. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. It was pivoting from the uh, from the quarterback here. Obviously, there's other needs. Um, I want to sort of move over to uh, tight end, sort of a spot that kind of people forget about a little bit. But obviously, we we have uh, Noah Fant that we signed. But you know, you you sort of want to replace a couple of guys. You brought in, you, you know, you brought in a blocking tight end. Um, there's a couple of guys in this draft. Who who do you see them maybe looking at? And do you see them going after tight end? Um, obviously not not the glaring need, like, but where do you kind of see the best value there for, for tight end where Seattle might want to pick one up? Well, you know, with a tight end position is is unique because you have a guy that's technically a, a flex guy that can get open and, and fan and you brought in the blocking oh, one. Yeah. So it's like you need an H back. Um, and, and this is a good crop of guys that, that you know, you can find some good H-backs in this class. So, you know, depending on how they view the level of importance for adding another tight end or what they plan to utilize, what, what they have on a roster, um, you know, you could see maybe day three. Uh, but there are some good options there. You know, I like I'm a big fan of, you know, Owen Glasgow out of Long Island and what he's able to do, um, you know, former Penn State transfer about 6'3", 250, is used to handling football. I think he has like nine rushing touchdowns in his career. Um, you know, he's he's played some uh, Wildcat quarterback for Long Island, so it gives you a little bit more versatility inside the red zone. He can win one-on-one. He can block rather well. He's good with the ball in his hands, and he's someone that's going to start to garner a lot of attention as we move even closer uh, to draft day. So that, that'll be an option, I, I feel like, because H-back is – you, you really got three tight end positions. You got your inline guy, a flex guy, and an H back. You know, it's kind of going to be your move guy. And they don't have a move guy right now, in my opinion. And I think that's where they can uh they can they can improve the the offense. So Emery, like looking at this draft class, where do you see the most value in it outside of the obviously first round, second round? Because you've got, you know, Jim Nagy stated on one of the, I think a podcast that Rounds five to seven this year, in his opinion, were lacking in talent compared to past years in the draft, that the COVID holdovers and the NIL are affecting that. Do you see that being a a trend going forward that the NIL will affect the later rounds of the draft and guys possibly staying rather than coming out of, say, a junior or something like that? Um, And also, like, where do you see the most value in this draft, in your opinion, if you were playing GM? Well, you know, it's, it's unique because, and Jim has a wealth of knowledge having been in buildings um, as a, as an official scout, so he understands, you know, the the complexity of of the situation. Uh, and I do think NIL will affect this. Also, you're you're seeing, you know, you're you're seeing less small school guys enter the draft because they're transferring up to FBS programs, and so you have all of that going on, and and guys getting paid in college, so. It does take a little bit off of, uh, you know, the depth, so to speak, the higher end depth. But there's still depth across the board, um, especially, you know, I grade over 900 players a, a year. Um, so I, I've seen a lot. Now, granted, some positions are a little bit deeper than others, but I do feel like you can find depth at safety. You can find a lot of depth at corner, a lot of depth at receiver, obviously. Uh, interior offensive line, I think, is a really good uh, year, both guard and center. Um, so I, I do feel like there is certain positions um, and by nature of how college football is, is being played, you're going to always have a bunch of receivers. You're going to always have a bunch of defensive backs 
Um, and I've seen some good linebackers in his class too, both off ball linebackers and and guys that I would consider sandbackers that can you know kind of be a rush in, but also play off the ball. So it's 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 a every draft to me is big on uh, you know really because the league is about ten percent superstars, but ninety percent of the league is guys that are in the middle. You know, kind of glue guys, rotational guys, some solid to good starters. Um, but the league markets to 10 percent, but the 90 percent is what the draft is about. Like, so this is a good draft class to really bolster that that 90 percent where you're getting good depth. You're building guys, um, and, you know, rotational depth. And you're going to see a lot of these guys get get playing time because of how, you know, the nature of the game has been, especially since COVID. So you're going to see your backup quarterback. You're going to see, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of guys rotating on on the offensive line. You know, especially on defense in the secondary, you're going to see a lot of guys play. That's why these picks and subsequent undrafted free agents are, are very valuable. Yeah, you, you you touch on on that, and you touch on say, for example, we 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 have a pretty deep uh, corner room, all right? And we have you know obviously the generational pick last year in Witherspoon, who you know we absolutely love. Do we just love everything about the guy? Just especially the mentality he brings like you know Bryce and I say you know if that guy was if you threw that guy in the legion of boom days 10 9 10 years ago he just fit right in with that squad i mean just 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 the mental aspect alone of that guy you know you just wish there was a bunch of other guys like him flying around um and then so you you look at that and and they do have some guys like Mike Jackson who's that so, you know solid glue guy who can you know come in and do different things uh but then you know, there's a guy that you know had a great rookie season last year, or the, for his first year year in uh, Reek Wollen, and then ho- sort of had a weird year last year, right? Just you know, um, whether it was injuries or just his tackling was pretty poor, his coverage was it was just like he was getting exposed. And you know, now obviously you have a guy like Mike McDonald coming in and the new regime, and you're thinking, okay, maybe maybe you can get him right, or or maybe he's just not a, a Mike McDonald kind of guy, right? Uh, physicality wise and all this kind of stuff. Uh, you mentioned, you know, it, it could be a good draft for that kind of stuff. So do you see them going after another corner, even though you could say, hey, that room's, you know, deep, but, you know, or is it like, you know, you know the only guy that's really got a starting spot right now is is Witherspoon. They they can always look to add um, because of, you know, the nature of what you're facing against offense offenses. You know, you, you got to be deep in, in the secondary some good press corners, you know, that you that you could use, some good athleticism that, that we have here in this particular class. I know a guy like Ro Torrance of Arizona State is kind of built like uh, Rick Woolen and, you know, can't forget about Kobe Bryant out that you already got out there. You know, guys, and, and I also feel like, uh, you know, combo safety is another position. You know, safeties that can kind of help you out in coverage. We know Julian Love is someone like that. Um and there are some good guys like Julian Love, uh, like Thomas Harper out of Notre Dame, another one that just kind of like can play, you know, combo safety, I like to call it, you know, kind of that cross between a nickel defender and someone that can, you could trust on the hash. So this is where you want to get better. You want to get deeper because also you got to really bolster your special teams units yeah. with guys that can run down kicks and cover that can make open field tackles. So with that being said, and, and what you said earlier, Emery, about like, you know, the the value of linebackers and off the ball and the edge guys this year, Seattle lost two Pro Bowl caliber linebackers and Bobby Wagner and Jordan Brooks this offseason. They brought in Jerome Baker and Tyler Dotson on one year deals. Who in the linebacking core off the ball wise do you think would be a good fit in what Mike McDonald does? We all know Junior Carl or Colson's the immediate answer because he played for Mike at Michigan. But who are some other names that maybe you get later on in the draft or, you know, that you don't have to necessarily take a second round pick for that you think could come in and possibly compete and push and maybe be longer term answers for Seattle? I mean, honestly, you wouldn't rule out a Jeremiah Trotter at 16. Why not? Right. You know, he is someone that is good on both ends of defense, smart, instinctive, great in coverage, great hands to turn the ball over. Um, That's another. And when you think about where the elite is he's my number one inside backer two would be edge cooper of texas a&m so you look at positions like that and like okay if there's two elite guys like i'm talking about elite in terms of you know they grade out higher than the rest of the the position why wouldn't we take one right there where we are in the first round because it's not about positional value 
It's about making a team better. Because when it's week six or week nine, and you know you just watched, uh, you know Trotter pick a ball off and go back the other way, you don't sit there and say, "Man, that's a great pick six, But could, probably could have got that value in a third round as opposed to like you don't care. Like nobody yeah. cares, right? Nobody talks. Nobody watches football like that. You no. know what I'm saying? And and nobody talks like that. It's just fodder for the internet. You know, positional value. You just want to know if the Duke could play. Um, but I would keep the, that position in mind now that I'm thinking about it. Um, it wouldn't surprise me, considering what you said. They're on one-year deals. Seahawks shocked people a few years ago, took Jordan Brooks, you know, out of Texas Tech, who was my number one inside backer that year. And people was like, why would you take that backer in the first round? And he goes in the first round. So I guess in that sense, I, I, if I was to celebrate, I look like a mock drafter, right? But the evaluation <laughs> was Brooks can play. You know what I'm saying? And you want guys that can play on your football team. So if 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 you're looking at where they sign, how long they sign for, it's almost kind of, you know, zigging when everybody is zagging. You think what he just left in, in Baltimore. You know, he left mm-hmm. uh, Roquan Smith. You know, you already have a sort of Patrick Queen you brought in in Dotson. You know, now you're going to get someone that could be that cerebral, um, you know, defense setter in Trotter Jr., or Edge Cooper, who is just explosive as all outdoors, now you're cooking with gas. Right. You, you mentioned Brooks and, and how, how you were really high on him. Obviously, um, you know, had, had a pretty big injury that he came off and had a pretty good season. Uh, were you surprised that that they let him go? I mean, I don't know all the you know, inner workings as far as, you know, negotiations were concerned. But, you know, obviously he goes in Miami on a deal where you're like, okay, you know, nothing nothing too crazy. Obviously, we looked at Brooks like, you know, it was obviously you sort of look at that defense as a whole and, and you know, rank 31st and, you know, just, just terrible against the run. So do you think, you know, when you look at a player like that, like are you still high on him in, in, as a pro? And, and, or, and were you just kind of like maybe – they just want to clean clean house and say we just don't want any of that anymore. Like we're we're you know Bobby's older and and you know the safeties obviously were were too expensive and getting older and all this kind of stuff. Do you, do you think it was not as much as Brooks? It's just as far as hey, we just want to clean house here and and kind of like like you know Bryce mentioned you got two linebackers, short term deals, almost let's like quote unquote try out kind of see who might stick. Do you kind of see it like that? Like are you still high on Brooks as a, as a linebacker in his league. Yeah, absolutely. I still like him. Uh, and I like the, that he's going to Miami too. Um, I feel like he's going to, he's going to thrive health permitting. That's going to be big for him, but it goes back to the point I made. Like these dudes ain't sticking around for seven to eight years. <laughs> like nobody is now. Like you think the transfer portal and you know, that's how that's going crazy. Free agency has gone crazy. Right. You know, so that's what, that's where we are right now. It could be a situation. It could be a financial situation in preparing themselves for, you know, cap relief or could be potentially if maybe if you're reading too much, you know, in the tea leaves that, hey, we're targeting linebacker with our first round pick and nobody's talking about it. You know what I'm saying? So there's a lot of different factors that could be in play. Um, You know, if, if, okay, if he's a free agent and, you know, he's been hurt a lot, we could kind of do without that. And let's try to go younger and cheaper at the position. I think that's probably more so than, you know, him being not a good football player. Cause I still feel like they believe that he's a good football player, but he got a chance to get it cheaper. And uh, maybe with some, especially with the two guys that I just brought up, maybe you got a chance right there to, to really, um, you know, kill two birds with one stone. Well, you know, Emery, with what you're saying about, you know, the reading between the tea leaves and saying, you know, Hey, maybe linebackers where we're going to go. I kind of feel the same way with that safety room that they've done. They've offloaded Jamal Adams and Quandre Diggs' contracts, and everyone in that room, from Kayvon Wallace to Julian Love, even to Jenkins, are basically on kind of one-year deals. I could see Seattle going after some safeties, maybe not up as high. I think linebackers more of a pressing need from building a wall and then wanting to work on their run. And who do you think are some – day late day two maybe day three guys that could fit into what mike mcdonald likes to do on the back end with his safeties we know how successful he was with kyle hamilton there in in baltimore but who are some guys like i like Jaden hicks and james williams out of miami who are some guys that you think that could be good later on possible picks for seattle 
I'm a big fan of Sanusu, uh, Sanusi Kane out of Purdue. I just feel like uh, he's a strong safety by trade, but he's got tremendous athleticism and twitch um, and has shown he can match up versus backs, versus tight ends. Um, he makes plays as a, as a blitzer off the corner. Um, so I think that's someone that to keep an eye on. Malik Mustafa out of Wake Forest is another one. Uh, very good athleticism, aggressive, um, run downhill, top down type player that can go and make plays in space. Uh, you know, so Jalen Simpson is a free safety, but I like his ability to stay disciplined on the back end. Can be that um, Marcus Williams in his defense because of his discipline in his deep third um, and his ability to break on the football. So, so there are some options to where. They can load up on safety, multiple types of safeties in this draft. And I think that's another area where, hey, maybe we can really, you know, strengthen ourselves and get some guys that's going to be the foundation of our new philosophy at, at, on our two deep. So that way we have something that we can work with. So therefore, in the 2025 draft, we build on that with guys that, hey, these are our impact guys. So we got guys that understand the system. Now we got guys that can really truly excel in the system in the next year's draft. So it's all a piece of the puzzle um, right. in terms of building a, a, a team of sustained success. Yeah. I mean, we, that's exactly how we feel. We, we look at sort of 2024 as sort of a building block to 25, 26, you know, everyone wants to try to get everything all at once, especially with all these new guys, Mike and all the new, the new regime coming in. So and it's interesting how you talk about, you know, players don't stick around like they used to and, and how you brought up, the NIL. I mean, just that's going to be interesting to see in the next few years, just the mentality of new guys coming to the league. It's like, you know, they're like not really loyalty, but you know, it's, it's, it's different now. Right. It's like, you know, it's like, Hey, you, you know, you had a whole team university of Washington gone. And like, we just, we just didn't see that before. So it's like, now these guys coming to the NFL, you know, how, how would you not have that same mentality? You're, you know, it's, it's just going to be sort of almost a given. So, you know, like you said, maybe, maybe you sort of draft differently and, and all this kind of stuff. Um, but it, real quick, I just, because you talk about 25 and, and, and I just want to touch on this really quick. Uh, wh what are your thoughts looking, just projecting next year a little bit? Cause we just mentioned 2025. If they do kick the can Quinn yours is quarterback that actually Schneider's name drop before. Um, so, you know, if we don't take one this year and we completely buy five, we figure, well, then they, they sort of, they have to do it in, in 25. What do you think of, 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 you know, that quarterback right there? And uh, just, just overall your, your, your assessment of, uh, of Quinn there. And if don't let people, fit. don't let people lie to you about the 2025 class. Um, I'm QB one right now and will be is Shador Sanders. Um, had he come out in this draft class, he would have been my QB two behind Caleb Williams. That dude is like, you know the black Joe Burrow. He is awesome, and he is he is a phenomenal talent. He's been he's been good since Jackson State, and um, people can talk that trash if they want to, uh, but he is good. And what we've seen from you talk about someone that had the Anthony Richardson jump. What we saw last year from Jalen Milrow was completely different than what we saw in 2022. So he's taking monumental steps forward. That could be a QB too. There's a lot of talent in 2025. And to answer your question about uh, Quinn Ewers, to me, he's kind of like Case Keenum, you know, or uh, what's uh, Kevin Cobb I, I use, you know, okay. where he's just kind of okay, you know, decent. Yeah. And, you know, he and, you know, a lot of people talked about why it wasn't A.D. Mitchell's yards and catches. Why wasn't he blowing the, the statistics out the water? Well, I mean, can't throw the ball to himself. You know what I'm saying? So it's, it's the dude that hands the ball every play. Um, and I think everybody has been trying to wait for yours to have this this aha moment to you. Like, that's why he was talked about as a potential number one overall pick. But we're three years in, and you're still trying to figure out if, you know, if he's that guy. That's that's kind of your answer right there, right? Mm. Um, but yeah. this 2025 class has a bunch of good quarterbacks in it, led by Shadour Sanders. That should be who everybody is going after in 2025. Not Mr. You know, complete seven seven yards a, a, an attempt on a crossing route, Carson Beck. Yeah. Nah, it's Shador, it's Milro, um, and there's some other guys in there. Uh, you got to be. It's tricky now because you know guys could be seniors, but then they get this bonus year for whatever reason. So 
there, but I know Shadour is, is done. I, I guess he has a technically another year or whatnot, but Shadour is the guy for 2025. So, so real quick, just, just follow Brett, I'll let you kick it up. So, you know, sounds like you're a little higher, obviously, on the class. And, you know, some people you hear like, oh, no, it's, it's just not a good class. Well, here's, I will say this. There, there's, there's, there's reasons why, right? I've been yeah, around the block for sure, twice, for sure. spoke to everybody once. The same stuff, no, the same things they're saying about this class, this upcoming class, they said about the 2017 class. Imagine them saying hmm. that about the 2017 class in a class that had Watson and Mahomes in it. Like, it never made sense, yeah. you know? And so they said it about the 20. 20 what 2020 they said it about the class last year right, you know going right, into it right. well i mean it's really just bryce young like but you got anthony richardson bryce young and cj stroud in that class like don't listen to people that say that that tells you they don't when they say something like that you already know what the quarterback class the following year looks like and that's why they're saying that so that's why i'm here to tell you if you're hearing that now expect next year's class to be chock full with with very good quarterbacks that can help a team out because I've seen this this uh story play out multiple times again by those uh on the internet. Yeah, so so yeah, I mean that makes a lot of sense. So the what I was going to say too, so say if you are Seattle, would you be totally comfortable with not grabbing a guy and especially, you know, later on like well, forget the project and and whatever, you know, unless you really hire a guy and say, "Well, let's Let's build 24 up. Like, let's just solidify stuff like the line and just get a few more building blocks in here, especially with Mike McDonald and everybody brand new. Instead of just be like, oh, we got to get a QB. Like you said, you got two under contract right now. Two Geno Smith's very serviceable guy. I mean, like, we like, we like Geno. We just, you know, you look at, well, we got to get someone for the future, obviously, you know, down the road. But so would you, if you're Seattle, would, would you be totally fine and say, you know, you know what? 25 is, is going to be the quarterback target. Yeah, why not? You, you, the best team wins, right? And you know, like I said earlier, no one player is that good. You better have a good team. Uh, we saw San Francisco get all the way to the Super Bowl um, with a good team. And if you're having a good team, yes, your quarterback can push you over the top. That was the difference in that game, Patrick Mahomes versus uh, you know Brock Purdy. But when you're elevating the team, you kind of can quarterback proof your roster. You know, and I feel like Seattle and the good teams tend to do that. And I feel like that's going to be a situation where it's going to happen. And and so because, uh, again, in 2018, you know, uh, every year the NFL does something just uniquely dumb. They let good players fall to good teams. Um, that's why Pittsburgh is always talented. It's how in 2018, my number one quarterback goes 32nd to Baltimore, like and Lamar Jackson. And so you don't even have to reach for a quarterback at times because a good player is going to be there. You guys got my number three quarterback with a first round grade in 2012 in the third round. So, you know, as, as long as the team is good and that team that Seattle had was 79, two years in a row. And then they got the final piece of the puzzle, Russell Wilson, boom, playoffs, boom, Super Bowl. So, don't uh, I think people always fixate on you got to get the best one at the top when there's good players across the board. Right. Hell, we just made a case for Jordan Travis getting him on day three. And we all like that he could play, but we all understand that he won't go in the first round. But that doesn't mean he's still not a, a elite level talent. So, it, you know, Absolutely. just the, the, the draft will play itself out because teams do dumb things all the time. But just make <laughs> sure the team is is good. So yeah. when you do have a quarterback that can play, um, you know, you're in a good spot. I got two questions for you, Emery, before, you know, we, we let you go. But one of them is talking about quarterbacks. I'm a big Washington Husky fan. They've obviously cut him off Michael Penix now. The quarterbacks they brought in, in Will Rogers, um, and I can't remember the other two. I think one of them's Demore Williams from Arizona. What do you think of Will Rogers and and his game coming from Mississippi State, obviously, and setting a bunch of records down there now up to Washington? Do you think, because he'll be a guy that obviously be in the draft next year, do you think he's potentially a guy that could be a decent NFL starter, or do you think there's a lot of holes to his game? The, the, for Will Rogers, it's about how he handles pressure. Um, and a lot of his numbers came from playing in that, that system. Um, and when you watch them in big games – 
you don't see Will Rogers. And that's that's your answer right there. Right. The NFL is all big games, you know, 16 across. And if you can't elevate the standout, and it just when you're watching, even from not from a scouting guy, just from a passing guy, like if you're just watching the game as a fan, right? And you know, and if I just see you completing passes but not really doing anything, I'm like, then how how much of a difference maker are you, right? You know, and so that's that's the that's the tell for a lot of these quarterbacks, and that's how you know when a guy is is you know a difference maker or just a cog in the wheel, right? My other my, my follow up question to that actually is kind of off quarterbacks, but off of what you said earlier in the show about last year's draft class and guys that could make impacts. What are your thoughts on Derek Hall for Seattle as a impact edge rusher uh, for Seattle going forward? Because he was, you know, they had they said they had a first round grade on him. He kind of came in like Boy Mafe, didn't really do anything as a rookie. How do you see that? And the other player is Jonathan Sutherland, who is a UDFA from Penn State at safety. What do you think his chances are of making an impact? Because he looked really good in the preseason and then obviously got injured. Yeah, it's it's fascinating about Sutherland. I remember being at the College Gridiron Showcase, I believe it was. And, you know, it was it a College Gridiron Showcase or the Tropical Bowl. It was College Gridiron Showcase, I believe, because he was there, but his equipment didn't come until the next day. So it was like, wow, I felt bad for him because he, he lost a day of working out in front of scouts because – you know, shipping didn't get to to Fort Worth in time, uh, but he's a really good football player. You're right. Uh, the other two guys, and this is why I always uh, stress to folks: like when you draft and and you're looking at the next draft, you got to give you the guys that they did draft time to play. You know what I'm saying? Like you, you if we drafted these guys in, you know, third round, fourth round, whatever it may be, we we have a plan for them. Mm. We got to see the plan out. You know, and let's let's see if these guys can play. First, because that may also factor in why they bypass a position, because the answer may already be on the roster. Um, and I, I like that you brought those guys up, because again, if they took those guys and they said they have a plan for those guys, then maybe those guys are some of the answers that we all are trying to say. Oh well, maybe they need to go DN. Well, maybe they already got a DN, you know. And I think both guys are solid guys, in my opinion. They're, um, I think they're rotational type guys. Um, they're not super impactful guys. So you're going to always be looking to to get better or find a, a more impactful guy. So, if, you know, yeah, they can play. They'll be part of the of the puzzle. They'll be part of the rotation, which you need. But I still feel like they need an impact guy, if that makes sense. Yes. Yeah, that, that does make sense. Uh, just so lot, last thing, um, if you're if you're the Hawks coming into this draft, what what sort of your you're just overall goal. Like, you you know, you got, whether you got seven picks, whatever you do, trade down, whatever, trade up. Sort of, what what's your sort of mindset and, and, and overall goal that you'd feel like, okay, we came out of here, you know, feeling pretty good about ourselves? Knowing where the game is won and it's along the line of scrimmage on both sides. So what I, my goal would be to make sure we have strengthened our depth along the offensive line to avoid a situation like last year. And on the defensive line, try to find a few hired guns. Maybe a guy like a Mo Kamara that's a little bit undersized, but can really get after the quarterback. Those type guys that people may overlook because he may not meet the height, weight, length, you know, measurables, um, but are good football players. And and come away with, you know, someone that can help out in the kickoff return game because mm -hmm. of how the kickoff return changes. Maybe we open up a spot now for another running back or someone that's used to running the football. Uh, from a kickoff returner perspective, and we spin a pick on a guy because now we can create blocking uh, schemes up front in a return game to spring something in the special teams department. So that would be the focus, O-line, D-line, depth, to avoid the issue of, man, we lost two of our starters and we can't do nothing offensively, um, and also try to sneakily get imp 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 uh, improve on special teams in a return game, but also – um, try to add some some underrated players that have good football skill that may not pass the height, weight, speed mark. So my actual final question for you, I mean, you brought up one and it just spawned for me. Kenny McIntosh that Seattle took last year, like really late in the seventh round, didn't see the field at all. Like last year going into it, I was really high on him. I thought he was going to be, like you said, impactful in the return game as a third down back. 
Do you see him having more of an impact this year in Seattle now that DJ Dallas has moved out of that kind of position and such for Seattle and actually be more of a factor? Well, you would hope so because he has a lot of the traits that would be excellent as a kickoff returner. The problem that I hate with um, – and this also is something I hate about college football. When you have a coaching regime change, oh, that's not my guy. Like, man, can he play or can he not play? Like, you're a coach. Coach was out there. You know what I'm saying? Like, I hope they give him a chance to play and not just come in blanket and like, all right, well, we didn't, we didn't draft him, so – you know, this is not our guy. We need to get a better guy. Even though you get a guy that's probably the same level as McIntosh that can do the same things, but you just feel some kind of way because it's your guy. Like, is I feel like coaches should be able to coach, you know, and get the best out of the guys that are, that are out there. Um, I hope he gets that opportunity because that's a great role for him, which is why a lot of people had questions about it last year. Like, man, you got DJ Dallas. Um, you had Homer, you know. Um, so why would you double up and get a back there? Where is he going to fit? And so now those answers have been – those questions have been answered because here he is right now, RB3, on the roster as of, as of today. Yeah, no, that's uh, that that makes a lot of sense. I mean, unless they go and draft another running back in the second round again like they've been doing. <laughs> but, I mean, I think we're we're good right now. Um, Emery, man, we, we really appreciate you coming on. Like, that was awesome insight, especially having you on a couple weeks out from the draft and just, you know, giving everybody a, an insight of kind of what – you know, what the Hawks, you know, could possibly do and just some of the some of the guys out there. That's why we really like your stuff. You kind of, you know, you're really diving in and looking at some guys that other people, you know, the mainstream aren't really looking at. So, you know, we really do appreciate it. Uh, why don't you let everyone know kind of, you know, what you've been up to, what where people can find all your work and, you know, go on and uh, find all your stuff. Well, we released our 2024 draft guide, which has over 900 individual scouting reports. It's the largest draft guide out there because it's no list. It's all scouting reports. So it's 936 pages, 901 individual scouting reports. And if you've been a loyal purchaser of the draft guide since 2020, since I, since I put those out digitally, you're sitting on over 4,300 scouting reports because – the last year I did over a thousand. The year before that I did over a thousand, and this year it was over nine hundred because a lot of guys went back to school. So you have a, a wealth of information on the entire league, the UFL guys in the CFL. We got you covered with a lot of these uh, scout reports. So that's where a lot of these guys are gonna go play. So you can go order that at footballgameplan.com/slash/2024draftguide. Uh, so it's it's a great resource because it helps you not only leading up to the draft. But during the draft and after the draft, as we know, the undrafted free agents are going to go start popping up and people are going to say, well, who's this guy? Case in point, no one had a scout report last year on John Hall, who I had a scout report on out of Northwood. People were like, well, who's this guy? Well, he was in the guide. So players like that, you're going to find this draft guide because uh, I'm all I go to all nine all star games. Um, so I'm boots on the ground. I'm at live games. I call games on Saturday, at college football games. I'd have a pregame NFL show, pre and post game show on CBS Sports every Thursday. So I'm I'm football all year round. And awesome. so that's why this guide is 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 uh excellent. Footballgameplan.com slash 2024 draft guide. And as in terms of watching the draft, you can catch me on CBS Sports HQ day two, day three, um, and post draft recap uh this you know that weekend as well. Awesome stuff, man. Yeah, so guys go over and and, and pick up the guide and uh yeah because obviously m some of the most insightful stuff you're gonna find um and we, we appreciate it again and uh yeah thanks for coming on we'd love to have you on again in the future and uh yeah appreciate you guys thanks for having me all right Emery. take care man thanks Emery. guys that was Emery hunt uh football game plan draft guide make sure you go and uh subscribe to that man get, get that online uh sub and like he just said, a man, thousand, you know, he, he's scouting, he's boots on the ground. He's at all-star games. Like this, this isn't a guy that's just kind of sitting back in his living room on his computer, kind of scrolling through guys. He's, you know, he he's like, no, this guy's boots on the ground, man. This guy is like, he, he is like, you know, there and with the vast football knowledge. Um, So, you know, having Emery on kind of giving us an insight of, you know, guys that you, you might want to look at. My my a big takeaway for me, man, I'm gonna be honest, is the quarterback situation and the 2025 draft class. When he's like, 
Yeah, you know what? And you and me have talked about it. Like 24 is a building block, but we were convinced about you got to grab a, a quarterback in 2024. He says, wait a second, 25? There's some guys to to look out for. No, 100%, man. And and having Emery come in um, and come on the show, and again, he made that point. What really stuck with me, obviously the 2025 draft class, I'm going to do a d- deeper dive on in that class and see – some guys that are in there outside of, you know, the guys that he kind of even mentioned. But what if he was talking about mock drafts and, you know, guys projecting guys like his QB list and how, well, I mocked them to New England, so I'm right kind of a thing. It's not really showing if you're evaluating them as a quarterback or not. You're evaluating them on where they're going to go in the draft based on right. what you think. And so when you look at his list and you see the Jordan Travis and Spencer Rattler at three and four behind mm-hmm. – Caleb Williams and Jaden Daniels, and you don't, you see a Bo Nix who everyone has consensus he's at the seventh out of the seven quarterbacks in the top half of this draft. He's got him down below Joe Milton, which in our listeners and everyone thinks Joe Milton's a project or should be moved to tight end or shouldn't even really have a, a choice to be in the NFL in some aspect or not. Um, you know, it's kind of interesting that way. And he's got guys like a DJ Irons on there who, mm. you know, I haven't really dug into much myself. Um, you know, Michael Pratt's on there. It's just, it's really interesting to me and listening to him talk about why he's not high on Bo Nix, his streakiness. Can he do this? Mm-hmm. Can he do that? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, yeah, I will definitely uh, be getting the draft guide. Well, and, oh, yeah, for sure. But also, when he, when, when I brought up Quinn Ewers, another guy, John Schneider's name dropped, you know, and that's not to say he's not saying, well, Quinn's not a, a good quarterback, but he, he's basically saying, here's, here's who I think his comparables are. And not that those guys were like, bad quarterbacks in the NFL, but they weren't great quarterbacks in the NFL. And if you're thinking, Hey, this is a generational guy or not, maybe not generational, but like a guy for our franchise, our franchise guy, he's kind of thinking, mm, you know what? I got some other guys on the list, you know? So, and, but that gets you thinking, man, like, Hey, don't write off 25. Cause you know, when he went back and said, what about 2017 class? Oh, wait, wait a second. What about that 2012 draft class? When he, this guy was my third overall, you know, quarterback, and you got him in the third round. Like, how did that work out for you guys? You know, so, like, don't be so quick to sort of, like, just brush it off. Like, ah, oh, man, 25, it's a crap year. Like, you know, whatever. We better take one now. We just, we're, 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 now we're just forced to or something. And with, without, you know, really, really looking at these guys, right? So, you know, to me, again, interesting take on, on Quinn Ewers there. Well, yeah. And, and the thing that I think was really interesting, too, and how he was describing it was, you build your team and then you add the quarterback piece to this. And I think that's really interesting because I think a lot of people really want and are gung ho to get the, you know, Patrick Mahomes. Yeah. With the Deshaun Watson when he got drafted or, Mm -hmm. you know, the CJ Stroud and, Oh, if we don't pick him at the top in the top 10, we're not going to get a guy. Well, we had that guy here that was like he said, third on his board, but because he didn't meet certain requirements dropped to the third round. Right. And you look at a lot of quarterbacks that have won Super Bowls over the years aren't necessarily first round picks. No. So, you know, we got to look at, you know, a lot of things when you're evaluating. Like for him, he is truly evaluating the position and the player. He's not right. evaluating where he thinks they fit on a team's roster and what a team True. would do with them. So I think that was really kind of an enlightening thing for us. And, you know, I really enjoyed it. Even like his talk about the linebackers, Jeremiah mm-hmm. Trotter, someone that yeah. a lot of people aren't high on. Like even Rob Staten, we've we've had on before, isn't very high on Jeremiah Trotter. Right. But he's talking to him le- about him like he's, you know, the top guy, him and Andrew Jim Cooper are guys that like, hey, Seattle didn't really do anything with linebackers. Yeah, they signed some guys on one-year deals, but maybe that's where they're actually going when everyone's thinking they're going to go edge or DN, D, D-line and tackle or guard, they're going to go linebacker. They're going to completely zag when they everyone else is zigging. Well, and, you know, I know there was talks and, and rumblings come up, but, you know, you took Devin Witherspoon number five overall. It's not like he was on everybody's board either. So it's like, and that was a fifth overall pick. Normally when you're in the top five, you can sort of nail it down a little harder. You know, like even last year, right? Our own our own team, you're sitting there, you're valuing like, you know, Jalen Carter, Anthony Richardson, blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, here goes Richardson and, and then all of a sudden, Devin Witherspoon's name gets called out. So, you know, you just zigging and sagging, like you said, and it's about evaluation and, and building your team. And even though, listen, 
I'm I'm still not going to sit here and be like, hey, man, like if they don't take quarterback, like like I said, like Jordan Travis, obviously he agrees with us that if you get that guy later because he like he's not going in the first round, but he potentially probably would have if he stayed healthy and people act like his eight legs amputated. It's just broken. But hey, keep that a secret, because if you think that's that's a guy that you're high on and you can get him. He wouldn't be mad at that. And he's saying you have the luxury because you got two guys that are under contract that can play at least a season, maybe two. Like, you know, he can come in in two years and and take right over. And, you know, the the thing I do like about the Jordan Travis situation is that fans will have zero expectations, you know, as far as like get him on the field, because first of all, you can't. And, and he's just, I don't know the timeline I'm right now, but it's, it's, it would be like, you're just you get them later, so it's not like a Jordan Love situation where you're picking them first round. Then the fans are like, "Whoa!" Um, you get them later, and and then he can just there's just no pressure, and you work them in. So that would be ideal. If not, sure, I'm not opposed to it. But like I said, like you know, the final question was, what what would you as a, if the Seahawks, you know, where do you want to come out feeling good? And you know, essentially, like you know, he wants to build the team. He's sort of what we've talked about: build. You it's 24 is a building block. If you get hot, man, things click. Cool. Like, let's go. Of course, we want to win football games, but realistically, build. And doesn't mean you can't be competitive. So, and then yeah, when that when you were ready and that quarterback's there, there's always gonna be guys in, in every class, you know. That's kind of the takeaway there. Well, and this is a thing too, and and one of the guys I follow on Twitter, and he's kind of more of a outspoken uh Seahawk follower. He says, you know, and I'll give him kind of his Twitter handle is Jared Stanger. And like, again, some people don't like his takes. I find him enlightening just because I like to cast everything, get a hold yeah. of what's going on with the community. He says, I don't know why people are acting like Seattle won't draft a QB. This is the exact setup of the 2012 draft. Replacement level incumbent in house in Geno Smith. Newly acquired quarterback via free agency or trade. Sam Howell, Matt Flynn, mm-hmm. and then you draft a Russell, and then you trade T-Jack somewhere in the near yeah. pre- in the preseason. So that's what I think is so crazy about this is like to me, there's so many things about Jordan Travis that scream to me that he could be such a good fit in Seattle. You don't have to play him right away if he comes in off his broken leg, which I believe he's pretty much almost healed from, and he comes in and lights it up in training camp, and he's the mm-hmm. guy. Dude. Well, we've always said for years, competition will weed out the guys that aren't. Sam Hell may not be on this roster come the yeah. first game of the season because they may turn around and go, hey, you know what? Some team lost their quarterback. We can trade Sam Hell off. Well, and we how much is here. Sam? What's Sam's costing you right now? Sam's costing you like, next nothing. Big, next to nothing. nothing. And, or it could be Geno. It sure. could be Geno. And it could I know be. people don't want to hear this, but the Seahawks have been no so non committal of Geno as a starter. Yes, they've come out and said the odd thing here and there that Geno's the guy, but it's not. Gino's the guy that we expect to take us this far. Well, it's we true. talked about it. They, Gino's they, they, the guy. And we talked to guys that say, hey, they were throwing his name yeah. around the around the combine time. And it just the, the market wasn't there. The market wasn't there. So, you know, you just you look at all that stuff. And uh, but you know, we, we are we are two weeks out from this draft, man. And and just Emery, just the way he just kind of gave a lot of insight, just kind of like, hey, here, here's here's the keys to some of my, you know hard work on the ground that I've done for you guys, specifically for the Seattle Seahawks, you know, and just guys that he might think are good value, man. It was awesome to have him on and, uh, you know, hopefully we can get him on sometime in the future for sure. hundred percent, man. I definitely love to have Emory back. You know, he's definitely someone I'd want to talk to after the draft. And even, you know, after the UDFA and free agents, you know, frenzy for rookies, you know, coming into the preseason, I'd love to have his takes on some guys because I think he's just, he's so insightful you know, and honestly, it was kind of refreshing because it wasn't the same thing we've heard from every other kind of draft expert or someone that we've had. It was some stuff that we hadn't really thought about, which I really appreciated. Yeah, no, it was it was awesome stuff. So, guys, like I said, go follow Emery Hunt. Um, just, you know, if if you don't know where to find him, Google him because he's all over. And, and uh, you know, go get his uh, game, bla- game plan draft guide, man, because especially if you're anybody into – college football evaluating prospects all that kind of stuff it's it's like pretty much a must must have so you know go uh go have a look and uh like i said awesome stuff man
we are uh, <clears throat> two weeks out. Um, yeah, it's almost time to get the popcorn ready, man. It's just, yep. yeah, I, I'm excited, man. So, uh, yeah, let's uh, let's keep on rolling. Like I said, guys, and uh, awesome episode. Uh, we got a few, few, couple, couple more coming up before the draft. Couple other good guests that uh, you're not going to want to miss. And um, yeah, so that's that's it for tonight. Tonight we're going to get out of here, man. Yeah, man, I can't wait. You know, our next double guest is going to be pretty fun, so it's going to be good. Awesome. All right, man, we're out of here. So uh, catch you guys in the next one. Go Hawks. Go Hawks. <laughs>